we meet with people that are generally in a bad place in some kind of a situation that they can't navigate and nearly all of them i would say most probably it's very rare that someone comes to us that claims they're not a christian it would be very rare that that would happen and of the group that all believe that they are christian and that they're that it's not a salvation issue it's a torment issue generally if we bring up basic truths in the bible they don't know them they haven't heard them they didn't know that whole area there's just so much that has to happen teaching wise around so many of the things because there is very little knowledge in the group that call themselves Christians and the church, they do not know what the Bible says. They don't know what the Bible says. And it's very shocking how many are regular church attenders or even grew up in a church and they still don't know what the Bible says about many of the things they come to us for help for that are very clearly spelled out in the Bible. The solution is very clearly spelled out but they don't know that because they didn't look there they called someone to help them the entire purpose of being a leader in the faith or standing out as even a born-again christian in the world is to be able to teach others foundational truths of christianity that are oftentimes written in the bible several times and there's really no other way for a person to grow strong and fulfill their calling and purpose for God in their lives unless they know the Bible. There's no other way. They cannot move forward in their destiny, their calling, or their purpose without knowing the Bible. They have to know the Bible because if you're walking in your calling, you by sure are going to have the attention of the enemy and he's going to attack you in areas that are addressed by the word you have to know what the bible says and there's very few places where that's being done where true discipleship is really happening and we live in minneapolis well that's our area we are serving this this metro area i get very stumped when someone wants to go to a Bible study or a church where they're going to actually learn the Bible and they want to know, do I know one where that's close to where they live? Nine times out of 10, I do not. I do not. I know some that are doing it, but then they wouldn't be close to this person. I wish there was a much longer list of churches that were actually actually discipling people in the Bible. And if we don't do that, we're setting people up to fall and to fail because they have only really one option. If the Bible is not something they're told that they have to know, understand, and has to go in, has to make the changes, there's nothing else that will change them. And they don't even know that. They don't even know from who brought them to Christ that this is an expectation. It's an absolute expectation if they want to grow that faith into actual salvation. Most don't grow into actual salvation that were told they were saved simply because of this area right here. Many think that those of us who actually follow the Bible and look into the Bible for the truth of whatever we're, we're giving an some kind of opinion on or thought on, we're extremists, um, unstable. There's really no great love out there for those who are actually Bible-believing, Bible-following Christians. They're generally not a group that people like to be around. Compromise has taken almost the entire American church over. 
And this has been a deliberate, evil, and progressive assault, causing Christianity in America to barely resemble anything that the Bible talks about. There is hardly, they do not look like the same thing. That should be very concerning to people. Many leaders are aware of this. They know this. If you tell them this, they, they know this. But they don't have the courage to take a stand and preach solid biblical truth because they realize they're going to lose popularity, money, attendance. There's a high price and they aren't ready to pay it. They don't really want to have to do that. They'd rather tweak their messages to have like a couple sharp points, but they don't want the whole thing to come through as offensive like the gospel does. They don't want all the people offended. They don't want a big loss. They don't want a bunch of people yelling at them. They don't want people talking about them that way. So their fear-driven version that they present causes many people to leave the way they came with no urgency to change, to become a real Bible-believing, Bible-following Christian. There's a ministry called the Mountain of Fire and Miracle Ministries International, and it's um, Dr. Daniel. It's a O-L-U-K-O-Y-A, I don't know how to say it, but he wrote a list of signs of a shallow Christian. So I'm going to read the signs that he gave of a shallow Christian and just know that this is something so alarming that if this fits you, you're going to want to hear what will happen if you don't change. One, a poverty of the knowledge of the Bible, which is what I just said. People don't know what's in it or they just know certain parts that they like to quote. Two, inability to quote scripture. So they don't know it well enough to even say it. They have a low prayer stamina, short, few minutes. There's nothing about um, sustained prayer. Four, they have an inability to lead others to Christ after being a Christian for up to two years. This is very common. Many people have never led someone to Christ. Five, lack of interest in reading Christian books or listening to messages. They'd rather watch sitcoms or reality TV. Six, lack of desire to worship God. Worship God is not something you do in a concert or in a church worship service. It's a lifestyle of worship. Seven, ceremonial attendance to church, meaning you are a regular member of the family of God. Eight, lack of quiet time. You do not have any time in the day where you are alone with God. Nine, you only call on God when you're in trouble or when you're in need. Ten, you're a shallow Christian when you do not share your faith with the unbelievers that are around you. It is the mandate of every person who calls themselves a Christian to not only share their faith, but build the kingdom. 11, when you pick and choose what you desire to follow from the Bible, you pick the parts you like, the parts that are convenient. You don't want to pick the parts that are going to cost you some part of your life that you happen to enjoy. This happens a lot of times with relationships. God wants you to do what he commands through the whole Bible. And the difference between someone who would be called a shallow Christian and a real Christian is that the real Christian does what's commanded. It is never an option. Twelve, when you continue to live in habitual sin, sin has become a habit. You are finding it difficult to break free from, so you don't. Today, tomorrow, the next day, you just keep kicking that can down the road one more day saying, I'm struggling with this sin. The thing is, if you're doing it, you're not struggling. You're choosing it every single day and you will choose it as millions have until the day they die and they're standing in front of Jesus choosing sin all the way to the end. No chance to repent at that point. 13, when you do not think about eternity at all, you only think about this present life, which is soon going to fade away with everything in it. And the Bible says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away 
with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And he said, since you know that all these things will be burnt with fire, all these materials and houses and money are raw materials for fire. What manner of man ought you to be in holiness and righteousness? How much time do you spend securing earthly treasure that's all going to burn up? It's clearly stated compared to the time that you spend securing your treasure in heaven where it will never burn up. The Bible calls people fools who get that wrong. They spend this life concerned with riches. They do not consider the next. They're called fools in the Bible. They will regret that choice. 14, when you're scared of men more than you're scared of God, you fear men more than you fear God. And so because it's your boss in the office that you want to please, and he asks you to do something that you know is against what God would want you to do, but you don't want to cause issues with your boss, so you do it. And I take this very seriously because I have been in that position a few times, actually. So I feel for people that end up in that place. I've been in that place for tasks, and I've been in that place spiritually. And I will say that on the other side of it all, I was tormented until I obeyed Jesus over obeying man. I had no peace with God, and we shouldn't. 15, when you avoid sermons or books that talk about consequences of sin, the fire of hell, that's a sign of a shallow Christian. You don't want to hear it. You don't want anybody talking about it. You don't want sermons about it. If you were a genuine, ready-to-meet-Jesus Christian, this would be a common thing coming out your mouth just like it was from Jesus. 16, when people cannot differentiate you from the world, the Bible says we are a peculiar people, and another word for peculiar is strange, and believers do not and cannot and should not fit into the world. They look at the apostles in the Bible, and the Bible says they perceived that they had been with Jesus just by looking at them. And when people cannot differentiate the way you dress and look from the world, that's a problem. Your behavior should just scream that you are faithful to Jesus. And that's why the enemy finds it easy to attack you. Because every time you hand him all kinds of doors to come through, and we have learned the hard way that it's best to keep as many of those closed as you can. Because if there's someone that will let him through, he's going to go through. There's a difference between being beautiful and being holy. There's nothing wrong with being beautiful. But holiness is commanded of God's people. And if it's missing in your life, you're not one of God's people, according to him. Purity and holiness are commanded. People need to look at you and say, that person is a child of God. I can tell that they are a follower of Jesus. That needs to happen. And if it doesn't, I would not gamble one more day being that complacent, that shallow. I would be making changes immediately because the when it says that when Jesus will return and it will be a shock and it will be like a thief in the night and everyone will be saying peace peace well we're heading into some pretty bumpy times it's not something that christians are saying the world is screaming the warnings so there's not a long window of peace peace I would be really worried if I were someone and I wasn't ready to meet Jesus. I'd be really worried about that right now. I don't think I'd sleep much. When you claim to love God, but God is not allowed to control your life, you don't ask God questions about your life. You claim to love him, but he's not in charge. 
you are in charge of your choices, what happens, who you're with, you keep in charge of that. But you say, I love Jesus. He knows I love him. I love God. I'm a Christian. But you make all the choices. You don't want to change the order because you know that it will require something of you when you have to give up that control. Many people are going to be put to the test when they meet Jesus and they've said the whole life, I love Jesus. He knows I love him. They will not have one word to say when everything they said and did is being flashed in front of them. They will see how much time and how much of their choices actually honored Jesus. 20, when you're comfortable with your spiritual slumber, you're comfortable with the way you, that you are going about your life powerless. You're comfortable coming to church where there's no evangelism, no house fellowship. Apart from coming, you just take your Bible, you pray while you're at church, and then you go back home, and then you come back to church the next week. If that's your Christian experience, I'm going to challenge you that that is also not a biblical Christian. 21, when you're practicing self-deception, you're deceiving yourself. You cannot deceive God. You cannot deceive the devil, believe it or not, because he's the master of deception. He's the one who gave you the deception. So at the end of the day, you end up being the one that's deceived. I remember a song in Carmen, the singer Carmen, he had a song that said, in the end, you will see that the dope that was the dope that got smoked was really you. That's not funny, but that's how he put it. In the end, you are the dope that got smoked. So at the end of the day, it's you that ends up completely lost in that. You deceive yourself when you claim to be spiritual, but you're not. You may not know it, or you may know that you're lying to people, but either way, it ends up in the same place. 22, when the thought of the second coming of Christ does not move you at all, when people are talking about a rapture and it doesn't move you, when you love pleasure more than the things of God, you're so fixated on getting one more bang out of this life that you are not at all warning other people that Jesus is about to return. I wouldn't even call you a shallow Christian because Charles Spurgeon says, if you do not love those who are going lost, if you do not have love and any kind of desire to jump out and try to stop them from going to hell, you are not saved yourself. So if there's not anything in you watching for Jesus to return, he's coming to take his own. He's coming to take those who are watching for him. If you're not, you're probably not going. Call yourself whatever you want. Say you had whatever experience, but if it was genuine and you really are in a relationship with Jesus, you're watching for his return. 23, when you find it strange to weep over people that are lost when you're seeing them, you see the lost being killed on the news, you see all kinds of things happening in mass groups, and you feel no pity for them knowing that that was it for them. They will not have one more chance to repent and avoid hell forever. You feel nothing about that. You don't feel anything about eternity when you hear these things. 24, when you find it easy to criticize other Christian leaders. Accountability is good and there's definitely rules around accountability. I did that last week. Criticism. The first pastor that I had up here in Minnesota, he would say, criticism is like a fly. It flies over the healthy parts of the body to feast on the sore. That's what criticism is in the spirit family. So if you are one who does that, criticism is never acceptable. Accountability is, and that's done in good order. Criticism is exactly what I just said in words. When tithing is very difficult for you and you think it's a huge sacrifice, this again puts you in a group where 
you don't get it. You don't even really know God because if, if you did, you would understand 100% of everything on this earth is his. Everything here is his. You own nothing. He has given us all an opportunity to steward his possessions here and we will be judged eternally for how we did that. Saved and unsaved, all of that will come out in the end. If you have a hard time giving back to God a part of what he handed to you, all of it, and said, steward this for me, and you feel a need to grip and control and make that for you, you don't know him. 26, when your sacrificial life is flat, you're not willing to sacrifice really anything for anyone. Even God. No sacrifice. You don't want to be having to give up things. And we see this when we ask for help around here. It is so common for those of us out here trying to respond to the calls that are crisis or even if somebody's just trying to move that one is really crazy because you can put it out on facebook i have a lot of people that will say this is true for them also that we need somebody to come help us move like even a few pieces of furniture no one we have one person that shows up same person people don't want to help they don't want to leave their life of things that they like to do to come help someone and in our case it's all women here and some of us are old it still doesn't matter they won't come help I'm really grateful for my um, serve group at church because they're completely different they've shown me they've given me hope <laughs> in humanity 27 when you engage in gossip about people Great people, God people, people who really want to be used by God, do not gossip, period. Because when you engage in gossip and spreading negative information about people, you must have missed the part of the Bible where God equals, equates that to the murder of their character. And I have been on both sides of this. And I'm well aware of how much God hates it. And how much you stall out your ministry. You can look amazing. But if you are leaving that in the wake and thinking that's going to go away. It's not. God hates it. He hates it. 28, when you talk down those in just in faith in general or bash the church in general it's one thing to call it to accountability to call it to what it's supposed to be but if you're around your children bashing people of faith bashing the church in general christian people on the news whatever if it's a a malicious way of going after those who are under the banner of Christian and it causes your children to reject Christianity by the way that you held it in disdain you will end up bearing the responsibility for your children choosing to want nothing to do with faith I would always honor especially around children I would always keep conversations away from them that can impact their little ears and minds be very careful what you say around children because they will grow up with core beliefs and different beliefs about certain things. And it will come back like in counseling somewhere where that came from. And you would be surprised how much of it comes back to something they heard or saw in the home when they were very little. They maybe even saw it wrong but have a relationship with your children that allows them to flush that stuff out. You don't want them making beliefs that turn them racist or 
the prejudice against some type of people, even a faith group of people. There's all kinds of people that are not of the same faith we are. They're not of the same sexual persuasion as we are. But there is no reason that we should publicly be assaulting these people because we all come from 100% depravity to the cross. If you don't like God, then probably trying to expose your sin a little more so you can remember where you came from. Don't identify people that way. Be good to people. We don't draw them to the love of Jesus by oppositional behavior to something we don't like about them. I have a real personal thing with that because I see it so much where some people are just completely pushed out because they're not at the place somebody else has gotten to and it's crazy. We should not sin with them. We should not compromise with them. We should not put ourselves in positions where we will appear to be doing evil. But that does not, that is not the same as how you honor them and respect them and let them know how important they are to you as an individual. 29, when you forget how lost you were before Jesus saved you and how far God has brought you from when you forget that you start to look down on people all people because you forgot that you also were steeped in sin condemned going to hell but for Jesus Nothing good from you ever changed where you are today, only Jesus. 30, when you're losing your focus on Christ and you're spending very long hours doing what you should not do, watching what you should not watch, something as simple as getting stuck on that phone, that has become a mess clinical problem for many because the treatment centers aren't really designed for the electronic problem but when you look at gaming and you look at social media you look at um, addictions such as the sexual addictions on the phone all these different things and you look at people stuck on those phones If you look at how many hours, because your phone will tell you how many hours you were on your phone, if you're not spending, if you're spending more time doing things that are not kingdom business, then you are building the kingdom. You have got a significant idolatry problem that you should get right before you don't have time. 31, when you cannot point to any activity you're doing to contribute to the building of the kingdom of God. And the truth has to be said, when people are saying, why is the devil attacking me? Why is it taking me so long to get all this worked out? If you really were focused on this the way you were supposed to be, it has nothing to do with you. It is not about you at all. It is about lay down all of you to worship Jesus. There's nothing about your life being better, richer, nothing. There is nothing in it for you except redeemed into the image of Christ to go to heaven. But if you're gonna keep you you don't get Jesus. 32, when you're unable to hold any kind of personal retreat because you're jumping from thing to thing to thing, you have no time for any pull away time with God at all because you are just too busy. And it's often said, if the devil can't make you bad, he will make you busy. He'll get you one way or the other. 33, when you are when you give up easily on faith and prayer, any small thing and you give up. So you have this thing that you want or you need worked out or 
something you want from God and you pray and you get other people praying and you're believing and everything sounds good and you're carrying around the verses, but then it doesn't happen the way you thought it would, the way you expected it would, the way that you felt you were owed because you did the right things according to the healer on TV. So you quit, you quit praying, you quit faith because you felt it should work according to some formula, not according to God's best plan for the eternity of everyone. Your tiny little life plan of comfort is what you're looking at. And so when it doesn't go your way, then you stop the fervency that you had when you were trying to earn something from God in that situation. 34, if you're always worried, anxious, mumbling and grumbling, if you are a Christian, you are a very shallow one. 35, when you have unforgiveness or hatred against anyone, it shows most likely that you're not saved at all because that's not allowed. Jesus said you're not forgiven if you do not forgive. So it is a, uh, something that happens when we end up in these situations with people but you should be moving quickly towards forgiveness and not carrying offense, resentment, and hatred towards other people. That's not something that you let build a nest and grow into what becomes a full hornet's nest in about a minute. That needs to be dealt with quickly. And it's important that these points are clear because if they're not, and you don't take them seriously, you will end up in the very large group thinking that they were Christian, that hear God say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Mark 4, 17 to 27 reads, But there is such shallow soil of character that when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there's nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds represents the ones who hear the kingdom news, but are overwhelmed with worries about all the things they have to do and all the things they want to get. The stress strangles what they heard and nothing comes of it. But the seed planted in the good earth represents those who hear the word, embrace it, and produce a harvest beyond their wildest dreams. Jesus went on, Does anyone bring a lamp home and put it under a wash tub or beneath the bed? Don't you put it up on the table or on the mantle? We're not keeping secrets, we're telling them. We're not hiding things, we're bringing them out into the open. Are you listening to this, really listening? Listen carefully to what I'm saying and be wary of the shrewd advice that tells you how to get ahead in this world on your own. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity, stinginess begets impoverishedness. Then Jesus said, God's kingdom is like seed thrown on a field by a man who then goes to bed and forgets about it. The seed sprouts and grows, and he has no idea how that happens. Matthew 13, 20 to 21 says, But he who received the seed in stony places, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself and endures only for a little while. For when tribulation or persecution arise because of the word, immediately he stumbles. And so... This is the error in pronouncing people saved when they say a prayer because this has not this part has not even happened yet and many people do they're immediately taken down by by distractions by trouble temptation tribulation they do not grow into a born again Christian because they immediately turn around and go back to something the Bible does not support that as saved. We should not tell people they're saved when they pray a prayer and say, I'm going to follow Jesus because they are expected to follow Jesus to be able to actually be considered born again. You cannot go back and call yourself a Christian. Matthew 13 tells of a sower who went out to sow and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. The birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, 
since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them out. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So to look at the seeds on the rocky ground, these people embrace the gospel with joy, but they don't have a strong root, and they wither and die. They ultimately leave the way of life and go back to their own destruction. According to this parable told by Jesus, they are not saved, and in the end, many people never even tell them that. They've told them they are saved, and these people believe them. Saved looks saved, saved talks saved, and the Bible clearly shows that shallow-rooted Christians will not endure hard times. They have no strength to stand against the schemes of the devil, and they may be doing great right now, hanging out with strong Christians, and they may look like they have their act together. But when the hard times come, you're going to see who they are. And I promise you, hard times are coming for everyone. And many are already in them. We all need a daily relationship with Jesus Christ. This is a marriage where he is Lord of our lives in every single way. There is no way, like I said before, that you can be 90% faithful. You have to be 100% faithful. And this means that we need to have a daily devotional life where we spend time talking to him, reading the word, seeking his will, which is something you generally can find in the word, denying ourselves so we can prove the will and purpose of God in our lives. We don't get to live up out of our own desires anymore. That is sinful. I don't care how good they are. I don't care if you build churches. If you're not doing what God wants you to do with your life, it won't matter. You're still against him. This is what the Bible describes in Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. So people sin, yes. Everyone will sin, yes. But it is definitely not something you plan out, that you purpose to do. It is not an ambition. It is something that you feel devastated that you did. And you make every effort to stop. You make amends. You, you ask for forgiveness from those that you offended, those you gossiped about, those you treated terribly. You ask for forgiveness. If we are not fully committed to Jesus Christ, then we're living a half-hearted relationship, which means we will not survive when the testing times come. We look like those in the world, and then it shows which side we are really on when the heat comes. And that is the test, and the fruit always tells the truth. Reverend Billy Graham wrote that it is not enough to simply say you believe in Jesus and then do nothing to live out or nurture your faith. Such a shallow view of your relationship with Christ can put you in grave spiritual danger, Graham says, referencing James 2, 14 through 17, which reads, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but they have no deeds? Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Christians need to live out an active faith instead of a passive, weak faith. Because Jesus died on the cross for their sins, Graham continues, and we need to fight the power of sin daily by the power freely given to us by the Holy Spirit. If you don't fight with the Holy Spirit, the one who was given to you to do that, you're choosing to keep the sin. If you wrestle forever against a sin because you choose somehow to do it in your own strength, you're again rejecting God in the process because he is very mighty to save. He is mighty to save. You cannot lose if he is on your side unless you choose sin over Jesus. You can make excuses all day long, but when you're standing in front of him and you see the holes in his hand, you won't have any that day. Christians cannot just sit idly by 
waiting for their faith to grow strong. It takes strong faith, a strong effort to have strong faith, he writes. Never become someone who makes it as easy as possible for people to make a decision that is supposed to be an absolute denial of self and an absolute commitment to Christ. Do not lie to people about something that has such terrible consequences if they get it wrong. This would be like someone telling your four-year-old they can go sit out in the middle of the freeway and you'll watch, you'll make sure nothing happens. But the babysitter is telling your four-year-old, you go sit out in the middle of the road I promise you nothing's going to hit you. I'm going to stand back here and watch. How angry would you be over the death of your child, which everybody could see was going to happen? Don't do it to God over the most priceless possessions he has left here for us to care for. Do not lie about what salvation really requires. Don't make it easy to them to make them think they can just do this one or two things because if you do that the consequences for you are going to be terrible also you will pay a very severe price and there's a very good chance you won't be in heaven either Jesus says very clearly count the cost before you step in he knows and as ambassadors for Jesus, our obligation is to make sure that people know what they're getting into. Don't wave them in and then hope they grasp the hard truth as they go along. That is definitely a lie. Don't do that because many of them never get anywhere to find out the hard truth later on. They fall away. They're still saying, I'm saved. I was saved at this, this altar. This certain person told me I was saved. The blood is on your hands at that point. God is so offended by that. And what are the chances you will fervently seek God in prayer at the end of the day, asking him to show you the meaning of the words that you are reading in the Bible? What are the chances you'll take time to gather a group of people together to study the Bible? If you're brought in that way, zero. There is no chance if you're brought in without a transforming encounter with God where your sin is exposed, repentance happens. It has to be started by God and finished by God. There's nothing we do to make that happen except receive. So, we do what we see other Christians doing when that happens. Many of them, I just had one yesterday that was telling me I, something about one of my posts really upset her. She says, I just can't do it. I guess I'm just going to end up in hell. And I thought, what post of mine said that? And she said, it's just too hard. I just can't do it. Come to find out she is not connected at all in church. She has zero people that she's studying the word with. She's not even aware of what that says, really. There's just no chance people can get up and moving along unless they know exactly what this requires of them. And if they look to many so-called Christians anymore, there's nothing required. There's nothing. They're living with people sexually sinning, and they think they're going to heaven. They really somehow think they're going to heaven because of some previous encounter that someone told them they were saved. They're not. We want a different way so that we can still do what we want to do, keep control of our life, stay with the worldly people that we like running around with. No one should ever be the person that is living a lukewarm, completely complacent and apathetic life in front of newbies, people who are trying to see what this really looks like, do not be the one who gives them an example that shows them there is no battle to this thing. That don't be the person that misleads them. 
because we will answer for those things. You cannot grow in Christ if you replace the word and prayer with inspirational YouTube videos, Christian themes, check out messages from great preachers, books that tell you how much of a blessing you can get if you turn to Christ, worship music. I tell people all the time, you can listen to worship music all day long. It's The devil could care less about that. Worship music does not chase out the devil. You have got to play the word, read the word, listen to the word. Worship music is not going to do it. These things may or may not be the problem, the worship music or the YouTube videos or the sermons, but if they are a substitute for an intentional and dedicated life of quality time in the Word of God and prayer, if they're replacing that relationship, they're giving you a false positive about your faith. You can't be saved on that diet. The result of surface level discipleship is clear both from the worldly observation and from biblical truth. A flimsy understanding of Christ, the cross, and the gospel is incapable of withstanding scrutiny and ultimately damaging to the kingdom of God. Don't do it. It messes it up for those of us who really, really want to do this right. Christians who in the face of adversity fold and bend rather than proclaim Christ as their Lord, though he slay me, yet I will trust him, as Job said. A lesser ability and willingness to demonstrate, appreciate, experience, and proclaim the joy of God and the glory of Christ to the world. And an intermingling of pseudo-Christian seeming stuff into sound doctrine. That is so common and is messed up so many people and so many have been deceived and drawn away by that very thing. A bubbling undercurrent of hypocrisy with those who claim to have died to themselves and risen with Christ, but they cannot be distinguished from the world. That's a lie. Their efforts to build the kingdoms sound like this. Say a simple prayer here, repeat after me. All you need to do is accept Jesus into your heart. Then don't swear, stop drinking, go to church every Sunday, and be a good Christian family while you're in church. And Jesus himself said things like this for an altar call. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26. Or any... One of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple, Luke 14, 33. Or, but he said, Lord, let me go first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God, Luke 9, 59 through 60. Or, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9, 61 to 62. That's the difference between Jesus doing the altar call and many churches today. The Dangers of a Shallow Faith is a book that I recently saw by A.W. Tozer. And here's a part of a review by Becky Laney. She says the evangelical church in America is facing some serious hazards that threaten to bring it to the brink of apostasy. The Bible has no compromise whatsoever with the world. The Bible has a message for the evangelical church calling it back home. The Bible always sends us out into the world, but never to compromise with the world, never to walk in the way of the world but only to save as many as we can. That is one direction. The average Christian today is addicted to pleasure. Can any Christian church survive today without a heavy dose of entertainment? It is a culture of fun, fun, and more fun. Performance has replaced worship. We no longer have worshipers, but rather observers and spectators who sit in awe of a performance. The demand is for something that will make us feel good about ourselves and make us forget all about our troubles. 
The church fathers came into the presence of God with a sense of overwhelming reverence that captivated them and brought them before God in holy silence. What has happened to that reverence today? Where are those who get caught up in the spirit of reverence before their God? Where are those who have experienced the holy hush in the presence of God? The church was never designed to be piloted by men. Rather, the Holy Spirit birthed the church on the day of Pentecost as a vehicle through which he could do his work in each generation. And boredom with religion is conceivable, but being bored with God is not conceivable. Those who have encountered God in his mighty, awesome presence could never come to a point of boredom. The true Christian has an insatiable appetite for Christ and the things of Christ, while the world has no such appetite. So if you have no appetite for the things of God, you are of the world. Christ stands alone. He does not imitate. Neither does he court the world in a lame attempt to win over the world. We swoon over celebrity, celebrity pastors, whether they, whatever they say, we accept as the important word for the day, even if it goes contrary to plain biblical teaching. Saint Ignatius said, apart from him, let nothing dazzle you. We are allowing everything but him to dazzle us these days. We have become bored with God and the truth of scripture. We seem to need something to jazz it all up and excite us. And this has taken us far down a road where we have replaced God. The world lives by overstimulation, one soul-wrenching episode after another, and the church is right there along with the world. It should be that great thoughts stimulate us to the highest passion our mind and feelings can stand. What we must remember is that only he who takes orders from Jesus Christ belongs to Jesus Christ. The evangelical church is in the process of compromising this very thing and ignoring, thus says the Lord. Yes, we want any benefits that Christ may confer upon us. We want his help, protection, and guidance. We even get misty-eyed over his birth, life, death, teaching, and example. The problem comes when we will not take orders from him. Christ cannot save the one he cannot control. To claim to be saved while ignoring his commandments is to live in utter delusion. When truth has been revealed in the word of God, our business is to find out what that truth is and in all of our teaching conform to that truth. We are not to edit or change it, but to let it stand just as it is. Nonconformity to the truth will bring disaster. It would be a great and very bitter error for a man or woman to go on for a lifetime believing certain things about God only to learn that they were not true and that is what's happening today to think they were talking to the God of heaven and earth and to find out they were talking to a God that they fashioned out of their own imagination that allowed them these things that were outside of the will of God even just for a season they want that there is no God in heaven that does that. It would be a tragic calamity to the human spirit to pray and preach a lifetime about a God who was not the true God, but a composite of ideas drawn from philosophy and psychology and other religions and superstitions. God is not identified by our experiences either. God is what he says he is. And we had better learn what God is and then conform our teachings to that truth. Read the Bible for yourself. Believe about yourself what God says about you. Believe you are as bad as God says you are and believe you are as far from him as he says you are. I am shocked by how many people tell us that they're a good person and that they, they don't even really know how God speaks to them or have any evidence of that. But they feel they're a good person and they love Jesus. They don't have any issues with the relationship. We are as bad as God says we are. And we are as far from him as he says we are. We have to believe in Christ and that we can come as near to him as he says we can. 
and accept what he says as truth. Our enemy believes in and loves slavery. And there's two kinds of slavery. There's a slavery of the body, which seeks to control conduct by physical force. That slavery was once part of our country, much to our shame. But there's another kind of slavery that seems to be absolutely worse. It's a slavery of the mind that is achieved by means of insidious ideas that were supplied to the mind. Once these ideas get our focus, our obedience is rendered willingly, and we are unaware that we have become slaves to the enemy's propaganda. But conditioning the mind creates a slave that doesn't even know they're a slave. We are continually being fed harmful ideas that we adopt and learn to believe in, thinking they are all right, and so we ignorantly follow them. Does this sound like something that's going on today? This is done without our knowing that a keen, sharp, unscrupulous mind is seeking to control us. There is no such thing as automatic pilot with our Christian experience. Every step is done by faith, active faith, that will be fiercely contested by the enemy of our soul, every act of faith, this kind of automatic pilot thinking leads to spiritual lethargy and breaking out of this tyranny of spiritual lethargy, whatever it costs you should be your number one priority. I guarantee you that after I made that decision and managed to do that, I, I feel like God stripped me of everything I thought I knew like he turned me upside down he brought us new teachers and i feel like we had to unlearn everything and relearn it the bible way it was i look back and i'm stunned at what my truth was compared to what it is now david wells of crosswalk writes of common beliefs shared by shallow christians People simply believe them rather than look for themselves in the Bible to show that they are not even true. One is Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. It sounds right, but it's wrong. And you need to ask yourself one question. As a follower of Jesus, one in a relationship with him, would it be okay if I joined the religion to become Buddhist, Jew, Muslim, a religion may be defined as a systemized practice of worship involving a god a place or place of worship a system of beliefs and in most cases exclusivity because each one claims they hold the truth so at the heart of the christian faith stands our relationship with jesus christ that part is true we repent of our sin we yield ourselves to him we confess to him as we confess him as lord and savior and follow him that that equals born again a new creation we have a new relationship with heaven the father jesus and other believers we even have a new relationship with ourselves because old things have passed away and all things have become new second corinthians five seventeen. without that relationship with christ we would only have religion nothing more the truth is that christianity is First and foremost, a relationship with Jesus Christ, and second, a religion. You must have both. Two, all sin is equal in the sight of God. This is not only wrong, but it's completely unreasonable to the human mind. Contrary to the Bible, an insult to God, and mind-boggling to those who actually read their Bibles. Billy Graham says about this, It is obvious that some sins are worse than others, both in motivation and effect and should be judged accordingly. Stealing a loaf of bread is vastly different from exterminating a million people. Sins also differ at the root. The Lord says there are degrees of punishment. Some people will have it easier at judgment than others. Sodom's punishment will be lighter than Capernaum's since Sodom's opportunities were so few and Capernaum rejected the greatest teacher ever. Jesus said some who deserve punishment would receive many blows and others few blows, depending on what they did with the opportunities that they were given. He pronounced a more severe condemnation on religious leaders for their pride and unbelief than on those in darkness. Make no mistake, sin is unbelief and an affront to the living God, but not all sin is equal. 
enough said there. Three, all we need is to love. We don't need to all be preachers. We just need to love. And we do need to love. It's a mark of a believer. Loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves is the two greatest commandments. But all we need is love is a loophole in a search. This is followed by lazy people. They're the only ones that would ever grab onto this. It appears to be chosen by those who wish to bypass what the Bible says about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves to worship, our responsibilities toward one another and the lost in the world, and our obligations to give, to pray, to serve, to teach, to evangelize, and more. There's nothing about the message of the Bible that says we are called to just love. For it says, people say in the Bible, it says, judge not. And that's from Matthew 7, 1, where it says, judge not, that you be not judged. This part of the Bible continues with, for with what judgment you judge, you will also be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And the point seems clear enough but unthinking people have cited this to rebuke anyone who is using discernment in their decision-making. Someone, for example, who's been arrested five times for sexually assaulting children, you wouldn't hire that person to babysit your small children. But for you to not hire them, you would be judging their behavior. So it is absolutely imperative that we use wisdom and judge wisely and the shallow believer says do not judge because they don't want to be accountable for anything they don't want to be held up to the standard of the bible so they think keep everybody from judging me and i'm going to drop the bar clear to the floor and i'm going to be okay down here the point of matthew 7 1 is not to condemn however Nowhere does the Bible encourage God's people to be blind towards false teachers and wicked con men who deceive them in the pulpits and others who tell them, pray this prayer and you're saved. That is a complete con. It's a false, false gospel. We are to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And the great deterrent to being a victorious Christian is the idea that once we accept Christ, ask Jesus into my heart and believe John 3:16 that that's all there is to this thing our life is now saved we can sit back enjoy the ride and this is the big lie that is just flooding hell with people who thought they were going to heaven there is no coasting in this Christian life if you are not moving forward you are moving backward you are not his if we're just coasting along, we are defeated. There is a way out of spiritual lethargy, but we have to fight for it. And are we willing to fight for it? Or would we rather be lulled to sleep by our culture and all the excesses that it offers us and think, I'm going to watch a certain preacher on Sundays and, and therefore, because it was okay during COVID, now it's we learned it was okay to sit home and watch TV and not be our and be part of the body of christ do we prefer to listen to all the various voices out there telling us how to live or do we take god seriously by reading his word and doing what the word says we need to ask ourselves what our christian life is like are we standing firm and strong in the teachings that jesus taught us or are we shallow rooted we go to church, we look good there, but the rest of our week barely looks anything different than anyone else's. Each of us gets to make a choice. Every single person gets to make a choice because it won't matter what your family history was. You personally get to make a choice whether you're gonna gamble and think that you can be a shallow Christian and go to heaven or you're going to get serious about this and actually start building the kingdom of God. Precious Lord, we are all, oh, there's so much deception in all of us. We are all just bent for deception. We all want to think we're better than that we're somehow 
good and we are not good. We are prideful, selfish human beings. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you loved us in spite of ourselves enough to send Jesus. But help us to not take that for granted and think that it's, it doesn't require that we also lay down ourselves for Jesus. There is a heavy price to pay against our self to be able to walk with Jesus and go to heaven. It is not a road most people will choose. And you say, few will find it. But I pray for conviction, revival, to fall on all of us, that you would help us, God, to be, to see what's coming and to see those around us that are not ready, that are going to miss heaven because they are not ready. Help us, Jesus, to be focused on your business and not our own, especially in these days. I ask that you would continue to protect us, God, that you would provide for us, that you would help us. We need you, Jesus, and we, we trust you for all the things that we need. And I ask that you would shake people awake. Please shake them awake in Jesus' name. Amen.